Mr. Schiff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Um, just so senators have an idea of the evening, um, we expect to go about two to two and a half hours. Uh, I'll make a presentation. Uh, Representative Lofgren from California will make a presentation. I'll make a final presentation, uh, and then we will be done for the evening. Uh, as an encouraging voice told me, keep it up, but don't keep it up too long. Um, so we will do our best not to keep it up too long. Um, I'm going to turn now to the part of the chronology that picks up right after that July 25th call uh, and walk through the increasingly explicit pressure campaign waged on Ukraine in order to get President Trump's deliverable, the investigations meant to tarnish his opponent and help his reelection. Now remember, by the end of July, Ukraine was aware of President Trump's requests for investigation to help his political efforts and had come to know that President Trump put a freeze on security assistance. So this is by the end of July. They also clearly understood that President Trump was withholding an Oval Office meeting until those investigations were announced. Both were very critical to Ukraine as a sign of U.S. support and as a matter of their national security. And their national security, of course, implicates our national security. In the weeks after the July 25th call, President Trump's hand-picked representatives escalated their efforts to get the public announcement of the investigations from Ukraine. So let's go through this step by step because the three weeks following the July 25th call tell so much about this pressure scheme. Let's start with July 26th. On July 26th, so this is the day after the call, Ambassador Volker sends a text message to Giuliani. And that text message says, Hi, Mr. Mayor. You may have heard the President had a great call with Ukrainian President yesterday. Exactly the right messages as we discussed. Please send dates when you will be in Madrid. I am seeing Yermak tomorrow morning. He will come to you in Madrid. Thanks for your help, Kurt. So, here we are the day after that call. Uh, as my colleague uh, demonstrates uh, this same day, so July 26, so the date of that second infamous call between President Trump this time and Gordon Sondland that you heard the diplomat uh, David Holmes describe. So that's same day, July 26, that we're talking about right now where there's this text message. Now, of course, in that July 25th call, the President wants to connect Rudy Giuliani with the president of Ukraine and his people. And so this is a follow-up where Ambassador Volker is saying to Giuliani, it was a great call with Ukraine president, exactly the right messages as we discussed. And we know, of course, those messages were the need to do this political investigation. Please send dates when you'll be in Madrid. I'm seeing Yermark tomorrow morning. He will come to you in Madrid. So here is Ambassador Volker, one of the three amigos, following up arranging this meeting between Giuliani and the Ukrainians. Giuliani replied, setting a meeting in Europe with President Zelensky's top aide for the very next week. Quote, I will arrive on August 1 and until 5, he wrote. Now remember, on July 22nd, so a few days before this and before the call, Ambassador Volker had connected Giuliani originally with the Yermak, and they agreed to meet. So this is a follow-up. You have that arrangement being made by Volker and Giuliani before the call, then you have the call, and now you have the follow-up to arrange the meeting in Madrid. And so they do meet in Madrid. Madrid. This is August 2nd. Andrei Yermak, Zelensky's top aide, flew to Madrid, meets with Rudy Giuliani, who they know represented the president's interests. Both Giuliani and Yermak walk away from this meeting in Madrid, clearly understanding that a White House meeting is linked to Zelensky's announcement of the investigations. In separate conversations with Giuliani and Yermak after this Madrid meeting, Volker said he learned that Giuliani wanted the Ukrainians to issue a statement, including specific mentions of the two investigations that the President wanted. According to Ambassador Volker's testimony, Yermak told him that his meeting with Giuliani was very good. 
and immediately added that the Ukrainians asked for a White House meeting during the week of September 16th. Yermak presses Volker on the White House meeting date, saying that he was waiting for confirmation. Maybe you know the date. And this is a recurrent theme that we've seen through the text messages and other documents, and that is the recurrent request for this meeting, the pressing for this meeting by the Ukrainians because it was so important to them. Giuliani's objective was clear to Ambassadors Volker and Sondland, who took over communications with Yermak. Here's Ambassador Sondland. I first communicated with Mr. Giuliani in early August, several months later. Mr. Giuliani emphasized that the President wanted a public statement from President Zelensky committing Ukraine to look into the corruption issues. Mr. Giuliani specifically mentioned the 2016 election, including the DNC server, and Burisma as two topics of importance to the President. Giuliani exerted significant influence in this process. In fact, when on August 4th, Yermak inquired again about the presidential meeting, Ambassador Volker turned not to the National Security Council staff or to the State Department to arrange it and follow up. He turns to Giuliani again. Volker told Yermak that he would speak with Giuliani later that day and would call the Ukrainian president's aide afterward. Volker then texts Giuliani to ask about the Madrid meeting and to set up the call that he had mentioned to Yermak. Giuliani replies that the meeting with Yermak was excellent and that he would call later. Phone records obtained by the committees show a 16-minute call on August 5th between Ambassador Volker and Giuliani. Ambassador Volker then texts Yermak, Hi, Andre. Had a good long talk with Rudy. Call anytime, Kurt. Separately, Volker told Ambassador Sondland, Giuliani was happy with that meeting, and it looks like things are turning around. A reference to Volker's hope that satisfying Giuliani would break down President Trump's reservations concerning Ukraine. But things had not turned around by the end of that first week of August, by August 7th. The aid was still on hold, and there had been no movement on setting a date for the White House meeting. Ambassador Volker then reaches out to Giuliani to try to get things moving. Ambassador Volker texts Giuliani to recommend that he report to the boss, meaning President Trump, about his meeting with Yermak in Madrid. Specifically, he wrote, this is Volker writing to Giuliani, Hi, Rudy. Hope you made it back safely. Let's meet if you're coming to D.C. and would be good if you could convey results of your meeting in Madrid to the boss so we can get a firm date for the visit. So this is Ambassador Volker following up Giuliani. Giuliani's met with the top aide to the president of Ukraine in Madrid. And he wants Giuliani to convey to the boss, to Trump, how good that meeting in Madrid was about the investigations so they can get the president of Ukraine in the door at the White House. Now, think about how unusual this is. This is the president's personal lawyer who's on this personal mission on behalf of his client to get these investigations in Ukraine. The president of Ukraine can't get in the door of the Oval Office. And who are they going to? Are they going to the Security Council? No. Are they going to the State Department? No. They tried all that. They're going to the president's personal lawyer. Does that sound like a official policy to try to fight corruption? Why would you go outside of the normal channel to do that? You wouldn't. No, you go to your personal attorney who's on a personal mission that he admits is not foreign policy when your objective has nothing to do with policy. When your, objection, when your objective is a corrupt one. Now, what does that mean, to have a corrupt objective? Well, it means an illicit one. It means an impermissible one. It means one that furthers your own interests at the cost of the national interest. The willingness to, to break the law, like the Impoundment Control Act, by withholding aid is indicative of that corrupt purpose, the lengths the president would go, not in furtherance of U.S. policy, but against U.S. policy. Not even a difference on policy at all. The mere pursuit of personal interest, the pursuit of an illegal 
effort to get foreign interference is the very embodiment of a corrupt intent. So here we are, August 7th. And Volcker is saying, Rudy, if you're coming to D.C., let's get together. It would be good if you can talk to the boss because we can't get a meeting other way. Around that time, Ambassador Volker received a text message from Yermak who asked him, and this is Yermak asking Volker, hi, Kurt, how are you? Do you have some news about the White House meeting date? And Volker responds, not yet. I texted Rudy earlier to make sure he weighs in following your meeting. Gordon, meaning Sondland, should be speaking with the president on Friday. We are pressing this. So there is Gordon Sondland is pressing this. This is the man you've heard from already, Gordon Sondland, the man who says it was absolutely a quid pro quo. You've asked about a quid pro quo. There was a quid pro quo about this White House meeting. This is what they're talking about right here. Gordon will be speaking with the president on Friday. We are pressing this. Ambassador Volker's contact with Giuliani spurred a flurry of communications. The patterns of calls from August 8th strongly suggest Giuliani's attempting to call the White House to speak to a senior White House official, left a message, then had a four-minute call with that official later that night. We don't know from the call records who that White House official was, but recall that Giuliani has publicly stated that when he spoke to the White House, he usually spoke to President Trump, his client. Also on August 8th, Yermak texts Volker that he had some news. Ambassador Volker replies that he can talk then, and Ambassador Volker updates Giuliani in a text the next day. Volker says to Giuliani in the text, Hi, Mr. Mayor. I had a good chat with Yermak last night. He was pleased with your phone call. Mentioned, he's referring to President Zelensky here, making a statement. Can we all get on the phone to make sure I advise, and here he's referring to President Zelensky, correctly as to what he should be saying? Want to make sure we get this done right. So here, August 9th, there's an effort by Volcker to make sure that they get the statement right about the investigations. Because if they can't get the statement right, he ain't going to get in the door of the Oval Office. It also makes clear who is exactly in charge of this, and that's Rudy Giuliani. Ambassador Volker is checking with Rudy Giuliani about what he should advise President Zelensky. And we know that Giuliani is taking his orders from President Trump. Text messages and call records obtained by the committee show that Ambassador Volker and Giuliani connected by phone twice around noon on August 9th for several minutes each. Following the calls with Giuliani, Ambassador Volker created a three-way group chat using WhatsApp that included himself, Ambassador Sondland, and Yermak. Ambassador Volker initiated the chat around 2.20 that day. And this is Volker chatting with Sondland and Yermak. It's a three-way chat. And Volker says, hi, Andre, meaning Yermak. We have all consulted here, including with Rudy. Could you do a call later today or tomorrow your afternoon time? And Sondland says, I have a call scheduled at 3 p.m. Eastern for the three of us. Ops will call. Call records obtained by the committee show that on August 9th, Ambassador Sondland twice connected with phone lines associated with the White House. Once in the early afternoon for about 18 minutes and once in the late afternoon for about two minutes. We know that Ambassador Sondland had direct access to President Trump. After all this activity, Ambassador Sondland and Volcker thought they had a breakthrough. Finally, a breakthrough. Minutes after this call, which was likely with Tim Morrison about a possible date for the White House meeting, Ambassador Volker and Sondland discussed the agreement they believed they'd reached. And it starts with Sondland in this text message. Morrison ready to get dates as soon as Yermak confirms. Volker says, excellent. How did you sway him? Not sure I did, says Sondland. I think POTUS really wants the deliverable. Well, we know what that deliverable is. It's the political investigations. Volker says, but does he know that? And Sondland says, yep, clearly lots of convos, meaning conversations, going on. And Volker says, okay, then that's good. It's coming from two separate sources. 
Ambassador Sondland told the committees that the deliverable required by President Trump was a press statement from President Zelensky committing to do the investigations into the Bidens and the allegation of Ukraine election interference that President Trump mentioned on July 25th. But Tim Morrison testified that he didn't know anything about the deliverable. He was just involved in trying to schedule the White House meeting, which everyone wanted to schedule as a sign of support for President Zelensky and our ally Ukraine. But Trump's agents wouldn't just accept Ukraine's word for it. Ambassador Sondland then recommended to Ambassador Volker that Yermak share a draft, a draft of the press statement to ensure that the statement would comport with the president's expectations. So here on August 9th, so we're still less than two weeks after the July 25th call, or about, I guess we're about two weeks. Sondland says in this message, to avoid misunderstandings, might be helpful to ask Andre for a draft statement, parentheses embargoed, so that we can see exactly what they propose to cover. Even though Z, referring to Zelensky, does a live presser, they can still summarize in a brief statement. Thoughts? And Volker says, agree. At his deposition, Ambassador Sondland said that he suggested reviewing a written summary of the statement because he was concerned that President Zelensky would say whatever he would say on live television and it still wouldn't be good enough for Rudy, slash the president, unquote. Yermak, in turn, was concerned that the announcement would still not result in the coveted White House meeting. On August 10th, Yermak texted Volker attempting to schedule a White House meeting before the Ukrainian president made a public statement in support of the investigations into Burisma and the 2016 election. So you can see what's going on here. The president and his agent, Giuliani, they want this public statement of the investigations before they'll give a date. And the Ukrainians want a date before they have to commit to making public they're going to do the investigations. And so you've had this standoff where each is trying to get the deliverable first. But there's no debate about what the deliverable is on either side. There's no debate about the quid pro quo here. You give me this, I'll give you that. You give me the White House meeting, I'll give you the public announcement of the investigation into your political rival. No, no, no. You give me the announcement of the investigation into my rival, and then I'll give you the meeting. The only debate here is about which comes first. So August 10th, Yermak texts Volker, I think it's possible to make this declaration and mention all these things which we discussed yesterday, but it will be logic to do after we receive a confirmation of date. We inform about data visit, about our expectations, and our guarantees for future visit. Let's discuss it. Ambassador Volker responded that he agreed, but that first they would have to iron out a statement and use that to get a date, after which President Zelensky would give the statement. The two decided to have a call the next day and to include Ambassador Sondland. Yermak texts Ambassador Volker, Excellent. Once we have a date, we will call for a press briefing announcing upcoming visit and outlining vision for the reboot of U.S.-Ukraine relationship, including, among other things, Burisma and election meddling in the investigations. Yermak was also in direct contact with Ambassador Sondland regarding this revised approach. In fact, he sent Ambassador Sondland the same text message. Ambassador Sondland kept the leadership of the State Department in the loop. On August 10th, he told Ambassador Volker that he had reported to T. Ulrich Breckbull, Counselor of the Department of State, who Sondland testified frequently consulted with Secretary Pompeo. Sondland wrote to Volker, I briefed Ulrich. All good. So Ulrich is in the loop. Sondland and Volker continued to pursue the statement from Zelensky on the investigations. The next day, Ambassador Sondland emails Breck Bull and Lisa Kenna, the State Department's executive secretary, about efforts to secure a public statement and a big presser from President Zelensky. Sondland hoped it might, quote, make the boss happy enough to authorize an investigation, an invitation. After first being evasive on the topic, Secretary Pompeo has subsequently acknowledged that he listened in on the July 25th call. 
Now, since he was on the call, Pompeo must have understood what would make the boss, that is the president, happy enough to schedule a White House meeting. Again, everyone was in the loop. On August 11th, Ambassador Volcker sent Giuliani a text message. This is Volcker to Giuliani. Hi, Rudy. We have heard back from Andre again. They are writing the statement now and will send it to us. Can you talk for five minutes before noon today? And Giuliani says, yes, just call. That's August 11th. On the next day, August 12th, Yermak sent Ambassador Volker an initial version of the draft statement by text. Notably, as we saw earlier, this statement from the Ukrainians doesn't explicitly mention Burisma, Biden, or 2016. Election investigations that the president has been seeking. So you can see what's going on here now. There was this game of chicken. You go first. No, we'll go first. You give us the date, we'll give you the statement. No, you give us the statement, we'll give you the date. And now, realizing, okay, they've got to give the statement first, Ukraine tries to give them a generic statement that doesn't really go into specifics about these investigations and why. You can imagine why. Ukrainians don't want to have to go out in public and say they're going to do these investigations. Because they're not stupid. Because they understood this would pull them right into U.S. presidential politics. Because it was intended to. Which isn't in Ukraine's interest, it's not in our interest either. And Ukraine understood that. And so they resisted. First they resisted having to do the public statement. And then they wanted to make sure they'd get the deliverable. And then when they had to make the statement, they didn't want to be specific for one thing, for another thing. This was what Zelensky campaigned on. He was going to fight corruption. He was going to end political investigations. So he didn't want to be specific. So he sends the statement that doesn't have the specific references. And Ambassador Volker explained during his testimony that was not what Giuliani was requesting and it would not satisfy Giuliani or Donald Trump. Now, presumably, if the president was interested in corruption, that statement would have been enough. But all he was interested in was an investigation or an announcement of an investigation into his rival and this debunked theory about 2016. Now, the conversation that Volcker referred to in his earlier testimony took place on the morning of August 13th, when Giuliani made clear that the specific investigations related to Burisma, Code for Biden's, and the 2016 election had to be included in order to get the White House meeting. So the Americans sent back to the Ukrainian top aide a revised draft that includes now the two investigations, and you've seen the side by side. This was then the essence of the quid pro quo regarding the meeting. And this direction came from President Trump. Here is how Ambassador Sondland put it. Mr. Giuliani's requests were a quid pro quo for arranging a White House visit for President Zelensky. Mr. Giuliani demanded that Ukraine make a public statement announcing the investigations of the 2016 election DNC server and Burisma. Mr. Giuliani was expressing the desires of the President of the United States, and we knew these investigations were important to the President. Now, according to witness testimony, as you might imagine, Ukrainian officials were very uncomfortable with the draft that Giuliani, Volker, and Sondland were negotiated. They understood that the statement was the deliverable that President Trump wanted. But yielding to President Trump's demands, would in essence force President Zelensky to break his promise to the Ukrainian people to root out corruption because politically motivated investigations are a hallmark of the kind of corruption that Ukraine has been plagued with in the past. Mr. Yarmouk tried to get some confirmation that the requested investigations were legitimate. In response to the draft statement, Yarmouk asks Volker, quote, whether any request had ever been made by the U.S. to investigate election interference in 2016. In other words, whether any request had made, been made by any official U.S. law enforcement agency 
through formal channels as you would expect if it were a legitimate request. Ambassador Volker tried to find a satisfactory answer. On August 15th, Volker's assistant asked Deputy Assistant, assistant Secretary George Kent whether there was any precedent for such a request for investigations. At his deposition, Kent testified that um, if you're asking me, have we ever gone to the Ukrainians and asked them to investigate or prosecute individuals for political reasons, the answer is, I hope we haven't, and we shouldn't, because that goes against everything that we are trying to promote in the post-Soviet states for the last 28 years, which is the promotion of the rule of law. The next day, we're now on August 16th. In a conversation with Ambassador Bill Taylor, the U.S. Ambassador in Kiev, and Ambassador Taylor stepped in when Ambassador Yovanovitch was pushed out, Taylor, quote, amplified the same theme and told Kent that, quote, Yermak was very uncomfortable with the idea of investigations and suggested it should be done officially and put in writing. As a result, it became clear to Kent in mid-August that Ukraine was being pressured to conduct politically motivated investigations. Kent told Ambassador Taylor, that's wrong, and we shouldn't be doing it as a matter of U.S. policy. Ambassador Volker claimed that he stopped pursuing the statement from the Ukrainians around this time because of the concerns raised by Zelensky's aide. At his deposition, and despite all of his efforts to secure a statement announcing these very specific political investigations desired by the President, Ambassador Volker testified that he agreed with the Airmok's concerns and advised him that making those specific references was not a good idea because making those statements might look like it would play into our domestic politics. Without specific references to the politically damaging investigations that Trump demanded, the agreement just wouldn't work. Ukraine did not release the statement, and in turn, the White House meeting was not scheduled. As it turns out, Ambassador Sondland and Volker did not achieve the breakthrough after all. Now let's go into what finally breaks the logjam, because that involves the military aid. With efforts to trade a White House meeting for a press statement announcing the investigations temporarily scuttled, Sondland and Volker go back to the drawing board. On August 19th, Ambassador Sondland told Volker that he drove the larger issue home with Yermak, President Zelensky's top aide, particularly that this was now bigger than a White House meeting, bigger than just a White House meeting, and was about the relationship per se. The relationship per se, not just about the meeting anymore. It's about everything. It's about everything. By this time in late August, the Holden security assistance had been in place for more than a month, and there was still no credible explanation offered by the White House, despite some, like Ambassador Sondland, repeatedly asking. There were no interagency meetings since July 31st, and the Defense Department had withdrawn its assurances that it could even comply with the law which indeed it couldn't. Every agency in the administration opposed the hold. As the Government Accountability Office confirmed, concerned DOD and OMB officials had been right that the President's holding of the aid was an unlawful act. But President Trump was not budging. At the same time, despite the persistent efforts of numerous people, President Trump refused to schedule the coveted White House visit for President Zelensky until the investigations were announced that would benefit his campaign. Here is what Ambassador Sondland said about the hold on funds and its link to the politically motivated investigations in Ukraine. In the absence of any credible explanation for the suspension of aid, I later came to believe that the resumption of security aid would not occur until there was a public statement from Ukraine committing to the investigations of the 2016 elections and Burisma, as Mr. Giuliani had demanded. From the embassy in Kyiv, 
David Holmes reached the same conclusion, a conclusion as simple as 2 plus 2 equals 4. Mr. Holmes, you have testified that by late August you, has, you had a clear impression that the security assistance hold was somehow connected to the investigations that President Trump uh, wanted. Um, how did you conclude, that, how did you make, reach that clear conclusion? Uh, sir, we've been hearing about uh, the investigation since March, uh, months before, uh, and we've been uh, President Zelensky had received a letter, congratulatory letter from the President saying he'd be pleased to meet him uh, following his inauguration uh, in May. Um, and uh, we hadn't been able to get that meeting. And then the security hold came up um, with no explanation. Um, and I'd, I'd be surprised if any of the Ukrainians, you said earlier, we discussed earlier, you know, sophisticated people, um, when they receive no explanation, or why that hold was in place, they wouldn't have drawn that conclusion. Because the investigations were still being pursued? Correct. And the hold was still remaining without explanation? Correct. So this, to you, was the only logical conclusion that you could reach? Correct. Sort of like 2 plus 2 equals 4? Exactly. Sondland explained the predicament he believed he faced with a hold on aid to Ukraine. As my other State Department colleagues have testified, this security aid was critical to Ukraine's defense and should not have been delayed. I expressed this view to many during this period, but my goal at the time was to do what was necessary to get the aid released, to break the logjam. I believe that the public statement we had been discussing for weeks was essential to advancing that goal. You know, I really regret that the Ukrainians were placed in that predicament, but I do not regret doing what I could to try to break the logjam and to solve the problem. On August 22nd, Ambassador Sondland tried to break that logjam, as he put it, regarding both the security assistance hold and the White House meeting. Ambassador Sondland described those efforts in his public testimony. Let's listen to him again. In preparation for the September 1 Warsaw meeting, I asked Secretary Pompeo whether a face-to-face -face conversation between Trump and Zelensky would help to break the logjam. And this was when President Trump was still intending to travel to Warsaw. Specifically, on August 22nd, I emailed Secretary Pompeo directly, copying Secretariat Kenna. I wrote, and this is my email to Secretary Pompeo. Should we block time in Warsaw for a short pull aside for POTUS to meet Zelensky? I would ask Zelensky to look him in the eye and tell him that once Ukraine's new justice folks are in place in mid-September, that Zelensky, he Zelensky, should be able to move forward publicly and with confidence on those issues of importance to POTUS in the U.S. Hopefully that will help break the logjam. The secretary replied, yes. Sondland also explained that both he and Secretary Pompeo understood that the issues of importance to the president were the two sham investigations the president wanted to help his reelection efforts. And that reference to the logjam meant both the security assistance and the White House meeting. At the end of August, National Security Advisor John Bolton arrived in Ukraine for an official visit. David Holmes took notes in Ambassador Bolton's meetings and testified about Ambassador Bolton's message to the Ukrainians. Shortly thereafter, on August 27th, Ambassador, Vol Ambassador Bolton visited Ukraine and brought welcome news that President Trump had agreed to meet President Zelensky on September 1st in Warsaw. Ambassador Bolton further indicated that the hold on security assistance would not be lifted prior to the Warsaw meeting, where it would hang on whether President Zelensky was able to, quote, favorably impress President Trump. Well, let's think about that for a minute. I took... Unless you have something further to say. Um, let's think about that for a minute. 
Bolton further indicated that the hold on security assistance would not be lifted prior to the Warsaw meeting, where it would hang on whether President Zelensky was able to favorably impress President Trump. Well, what do you think would favorably impress President Trump? What were the only two things that President Trump asked of President Zelensky? What were the two things that Rudy Giuliani was asking of President Zelensky and his top aides? What would favorably impress Donald Trump? Would Donald Trump be favorably impressed if President Zelensky were to tell him about this new corruption court or new legislation in the RADA or how negotiations with the Russians were going or how they're bringing about defense reform? Had any of those things ever come up in any of these text messages, any of these emails, any of these phone calls, any of these conversations? Of course not. Of course not. There was only one thing that was going to favorably impress President Trump in Warsaw, and that is if Zelensky told him to his face, I'm going to do these political investigations. I don't want to do them. You know I don't want to do them. I've resisted doing them. But I'm at war with Russia, and I can't wait anymore. I can't wait anymore. I'm sure that would have impressed Donald Trump. But the meeting between the, between the two presidents never happened in Warsaw. President Trump canceled the trip at the last moment. Before Bolton left Kyiv, Ambassador Taylor asked for a private meeting. Ambassador Taylor explained that he was extremely concerned about the hold on security assistance. He described the meeting to us during his testimony. Near the end of Ambassador Bolton's visit, I asked to meet him privately, during which I expressed to him, my serious concern about the withholding of military assistance to Ukraine while the Ukrainians were defending their country from Russian aggression. Ambassador Bolton recommended that I send a first-person cable to Secretary Pompeo directly, relaying my concerns. Now, in the State Department, sending a first-person cable is an extraordinary step. State Department cables are ordinarily written in the third person as Ambassador Taylor testified at his deposition, sending a first-person cable gets attention because there are not many first-person cables that come in. In fact, in his decades of service in the diplomatic corps, he had never written a single one until now. Taylor sent that cable on August 29th. Would you like me to read that to you right now? I would like to read it to you right now, except I don't have it because the State Department wouldn't provide it. But if you'd like me to read it to you, we can do something about that. We can insist on getting that from the State Department. If you'd like to know what John Bolton had in mind when he thought that Zelensky could favorably impress the President in Warsaw, we can find that out too, just for the asking, and a document called a subpoena. So Taylor sends that cable August 29th, the State Department did not provide that cable to us in response to the subpoena. But witnesses who reviewed it described it as a powerful message that described the folly, the folly of withholding military aid from Ukraine at a time when it was facing incursion from Russian forces in eastern Ukraine. That cable also sought to explain that U.S. assistance to Ukraine was, in, was vital to U.S. national security as well. Now, why don't they want us to see that cable? Why don't they want us to see that cable? Maybe they don't want you to see that cable because that cable from a Vietnam veteran describes just how essential that military assistance was, not to just to Ukraine. Maybe they don't want you to see that cable because it describes just how important that military assistance is to us, to us. President's Council would love you to believe this is just about Ukraine. You don't need to care about Ukraine. Who cares about Ukraine? How many people could find Ukraine on a map? Why should we care about Ukraine? Well, we should care about Ukraine. They're an ally of ours. If it matters to us, we should care about the fact that in 1994, when we asked them to give up their nuclear weapons that they had inherited from the Soviet Union, and they didn't want to give them up, and we were worried about proliferation. 
We said, hey, if you give them up, which you don't want to do because you're worried the Russians might invade, if you give them up, we will help assure your territorial integrity. We made that commitment. I hope we care about that. I hope we care about that because they did give them up. And you know what? Just what they feared took place. The Russians moved across their border and they remain occupying part of Ukraine. That's the word of America we gave. And we're breaking that word. Why? For help with a political campaign? Ambassador Taylor was exactly right. That's crazy. It's worse than crazy. It's repulsive. It's repugnant. It breaks our word. And to do it in the name of, of these corrupt investigations is also contrary to, to everything we espouse around the world. I used to be part of a commission in the House on Democracy Assistance, where we would meet with parliamentarians. And I know my Senate colleagues do much the same thing. And we would, we would urge our colleagues to observe the rule of law, not to engage in political investigations and prosecutions. I don't know how we make that argument now. I don't know how we look our allies or these burgeoning democracies in the face, our fellow parliamentarians, and make that argument now. How do we make that argument now? Now, testimony indicated that uh, Secretary Pompeo eventually carried that cable into the White House. But there's no evidence that those national security current concerns that they don't want you to see were able to outweigh the president's personal interest in his getting foreign help in his reelection campaign. There's no evidence at all. Now we get to August 28th. Politico was the first to publicly report, publicly report that President Trump had implemented a hold on nearly 400 million of U.S. military assistance to Ukraine that had been appropriated by Congress. Now that the worst kept secret was public, Ukrainian officials immediately expressed their alarm and concern to their American counterparts. As witnesses explained, the Ukrainians had two serious concerns. One, of course, was the aid itself, which was vital to their ability to fight off Russia. But in addition, they were worried about the symbolism of the hold, that it signaled to Russia and Vladimir Putin that the United States was wavering in its support for Ukraine. Witnesses testified that this was a division that Russia could and would exploit to drive further wedge between the United States and Ukraine to its advantage. The second concern was why, likely why, Ukrainian officials had wanted the hold to remain a secret in the first place, because it would add to the negative impact to Ukraine if the hold itself became public. It was bad enough that the President of the United States put a hold on their aid, it was going to be far worse if it became public, as indeed it did. Andre Yermak, the same Zelensky aide, sent Ambassador Volker a link to the political story, Politico story, and then texted, need to talk with you. Other Ukrainian officials also expressed concerns to Ambassador Volker that the Ukrainian, Ukrainian government was being singled out and penalized for some reason. Well, what do we think that reason was? Why were they being singled out? Why was that country being singled out? That was the one country that this president could lever for help against an opponent he feared. That's why Ukraine was being singled out. On August 29th, Yermak also contacted Ambassador Taylor. Yermak said the Ukrainians were very concerned about the hold of military assistance. He said that he and other Ukrainian officials would be willing to travel to Washington to explain to U.S. officials the importance of this assistance. Ambassador Taylor, who was on the ground in Ukraine, explained the Ukrainian viewpoint and, frankly, their desperation. In September, the Minister of Defense, for example, came to me, I would use the word desperate, to figure out why the assistance was being held. He thought that perhaps if he went to Washington to talk to you, to talk to the, to the Secretary of Defense, to talk to the President, he would be able to find out and, and reassure 
provide whatever answer was necessary to have that assistance released. Without any official explanation for the hold, American officials could provide little reassurance to their Ukrainian counterparts. It has been publicly reported that President Trump, Secretary Esper, and Secretary Pompeo met in late August and that they all implored the president to release the aid. But President Trump continued to refuse to release the aid. As of August 30th, the president was clearly directing OMB to continue the hold on security assistance. In documents reviewed by Just Security but withheld from the Congress by OMB on the president's instructions, OMB official Michael Duffy emailed DOD controller Elaine McCusker that there is, quote, clear direction from POTUS to continue the hold. So here we are, August 30th. A month after that July 25th call, aid still being withheld. Ukrainians still holding on, still not willing to capitulate, not willing to violate Zelensky's whole campaign pledge about not engaging in corrupt investigations. That same day, August 30th, Republican Senator Ron Johnson spoke with Ambassador Sondland to express his concern about President Trump's decision to withhold military assistance to Ukraine. Senator Johnson described that call in an interview with the Wall Street Journal. According to Senator Johnson, Ambassador Sondland told him that if Ukraine would commit to, quote, get to the bottom of what happened in 2016, if President Trump has that confidence, then he'll release the military spending. Senator Johnson added, at that suggestion, I winced. My reaction was, oh God, I don't want to see those two things combined. The next day, August 31st, Senator Johnson spoke by phone with President Trump regarding the decision to withhold aid to Ukraine. According to the Wall Street Journal, President Trump denied the quid pro quo that Senator Johnson had learned of from Ambassador Sondland. At the same time, however, President Trump refused to authorize Senator Johnson to tell Ukrainian officials on his upcoming trip to Kyiv that the aid would be forthcoming. The message that Ambassador Sondland communicated to Senator Johnson mirrored that used by President Trump during the July 25th call with President Zelensky, in which President Trump twice asked the Ukrainian leader to get to the bottom of it, including in connection to an investigation into the debunked conspiracy theory of Ukrainian interference in the 2016 election. It also mirrored the language of the text message that Ambassador Volker sent to President Zelensky's aide just before the July 25th call. Indeed, despite the President's self-serving denials, the message was clear. President Trump wanted the investigations, and he would withhold not one, but two acts vested in him by the power of his office in order to get them. Now begins September. September 1st. The president was supposed to go to Warsaw, as we know, but he doesn't go to Warsaw. Mike Pence goes to Warsaw. Jennifer Williams, special advisor to the vice president for Europe and Russia, learned of the change in the president's travel plans on August 29th. The vice president's national security advisor asked at the request of Vice President Pence for an update on the status of the security assistance that had just been publicly revealed in Politico and would be a critical issue during the bilateral meeting between the Vice President and President Zelensky in Warsaw. The delegation arrives in Warsaw and gathers in a hotel room to brief Vice President Pence before he met with the Ukrainian President. National Security Advisor Bolton led the meeting. As Williams described it, advisors in the room quote, agreed on the need to get a final decision on security assistance as soon as possible so that it could be implemented before the end of the year. But Vice President Pence did not have authority from the president to release the aid. Ambassador Sondland also attended that briefing. At the end of it, he expressed concern directly to Vice President Pence about the security assistance being held until the Ukrainians announced the very same politically motivated investigations at the heart of the scheme. Now you mentioned that uh, you also had a conversation with Vice President Pence
before his meeting with President Zelensky in Warsaw, and that you raised the concern you had as well that the security assistance was being withheld because of the President's desire to get a commitment from Zelensky to pursue these political investigations. What did you say to the Vice President? I was in a briefing uh, with several people, and I just spoke up and I said, it appears that everything is stalled until this statement gets made, something that words to that effect, uh, and that's what I believe to be the case based on, uh, you know, the work that the three of us had been doing, Volker, Perry, and myself, and the Vice President nodded like, you know, he, he heard what I said, and that was pretty much it, as I recall. Everyone was in the loop. Ambassador Sondland testified that Vice President Pence was neither surprised nor dismayed by the description of this quid pro quo. At the beginning of the bilateral meeting between President Zelensky and Vice President Pence, as expected, the first question from President Zelensky related to the status of the security assistance. As Vice President Pence's aide, Jennifer Williams, testified, President Zelensky explained that just equally with the financial and physical value of the assistance, that it was the symbolic nature of that assistance that really was the show of U.S. support for Ukraine and for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Later that day, Vice President Pence spoke to the President about his meeting with President Zelensky. But the hold on security assistance remained in place well after President Pence, Vice President Pence returned from Warsaw. And after the meeting, the Warsaw meeting with Vice President Pence, Ambassador Sondland quickly pulled aside Andrei Yermak, Zelensky's top aide, and informed him that the aide would not be forthcoming until Ukraine publicly announced the two investigations that President Trump wanted. So here we are, after the meeting, right after the meeting, they're still in Warsaw, and Zelensky pulls aside his Ukrainian counterpart, Yermak, and explains the aid is not coming until the investigations are announced. Based on my previous communication with Secretary Pompeo, I felt comfortable sharing my concerns with Mr. Yermak. It was a very, very brief pull-aside conversation that happened within a few seconds. I told Mr. Yermak that I believed that the resumption of U.S. aid would likely not occur until Ukraine took some kind of action on the public statement that we had been discussing for many weeks. I mean, let's let that sink in for a minute, too. You've heard uh, my colleagues at the other table say, Ukrainians felt no pressure. There's no evidence they felt any pressure. Of course, we've already had testimony about how they did feel pressure and they did want to be drawn into this political campaign. And you saw over and over in these text messages and emails, no, you go first, you announce, no, you go first. And we're supposed to believe they felt no pressure. And there it is, it breaks out in the open. The military is being, aid is being withheld. And there's a connection between the holding of the military aid and these investigations, and the first thing they're asking about, they send the copy of the article, what's happening with this aid? They're ready to come to D.C. to plead for the aid. They go to Warsaw. They meet with the vice president. It's the first question is the aid. And what happens after that meeting? Now, that's a big meeting, by the way, with the vice president, the Ukrainian delegation. It's not like in front of all those people, the vice president is going to bring it up. And so Sondland goes up to his counterpart right after that on the sidelines of that meeting, and he says, basically, you ain't getting the money until you do the investigations. And we're to believe they felt no pressure. Folks, they're at war. They're at war and they're being told you're not getting 400 million in aid you need unless you do what the president wants. And what the president wants are these two investigations. If you don't believe that's pressure, that's $400 million worth of pressure. I got a bridge I want to sell you. It's hard for us to put ourselves in the Ukrainians' position. I mean, imagine the eastern third of our country were occupied by an enemy force. And we're beholden to another country for military aid. 
and they're saying you're not going to get it until you do what we want, do you think we'd feel pressured? I think we'd feel pressured. And that's exactly the situation the Ukrainians were in now. You've heard my counsel, the other counsel say before, well, but they say they don't feel pressure. Like they're going to admit they were being shaken down by the President of the United States. You think they feel pressure now? You should see what kind of pressure they feel if they admitted that. Tim Morrison, the NSC official, witnessed the conversation between Sondland and Yermak from across the room and immediately thereafter received a summary from Ambassador Sondland. He reported the substance of that conversation to his boss, Ambassador, Ambassador Bolton, who told Morrison to consult with the lawyers. Go talk to the lawyers. You know, if, if you keep getting told you got to go talk to the lawyers, there's a problem. If things are perfect, you don't get told, go talk to the lawyers time and time again. Morrison confirmed that he did talk to the lawyers, in part to ensure there was a record of what Ambassador Sondland was doing. That record exists within the White House. Would you like me to read you that record? I'd be happy to read you that record. It's, it's there for your asking. Of course, the President has refused to provide that record. Precisely why did Ambassador Bolton direct Morrison to tell the lawyers, to talk to the lawyers? Would you like Ambassador Bolton to tell you why he said that? He'd be happy to tell you why he said that. He's there for your asking. What did Bolton know about the freeze and aid prior to this meeting in Warsaw? What, what did he mean that if he can press Zelensky, it's going to depend on whether he can press Zelensky? Would you like to know what that meant? I'd like to know what he meant by that. I think we know what he meant by that. Tim Morrison also conveyed the substance of the Sondland Yermak pull aside to his colleague, Ambassador Taylor. So this is now Tim Morrison, told by Bolton, go talk to the lawyers, and he talks to also Ambassador Taylor, our ambassador in Ukraine. On the evening of September 1st, I received a readout of the Pence Zelensky meeting over the phone from Mr. Morrison, during which he told me that President Zelensky had opened the meeting by immediately asking Vice President about the security cooperation. The Vice President did not respond substantively, but said that he would talk to President Trump that night. The Vice President did say that President Trump wanted the Europeans to do more to support Ukraine and that he wanted the Ukrainians to do more to fight corruption. During the same phone call with Mr. Morrison, he described a conversation Ambassador Sondland had with Mr. Yermak in Warsaw. Ambassador Sondland told Mr. Yermak that the security assistance money would not come until President Zelensky committed to pursue the Burisma investigation. I was alarmed by what Mr. Morrison told me about the sondland yermak conversation. Ambassador Taylor then explained why he was so alarmed by this turn. Let's hear that as well. You said previously that you were alarmed to learn this. Why were you alarmed? It's one thing to try to leverage a meeting in the White House. It's another thing, I thought, um, to leverage security assistance, security assistance to a country at war, um, dependent on both the security assistance and the demonstration of support. It was, it was much more alarming. The, the, the White House meeting was one thing, security assistance was much more alarming. Upon learning from Mr. Morrison that the military aid may be conditioned on Ukraine publicly announcing these two investigations, Ambassador Taylor sends an urgent text message to Ambassador Sondland asking, are we now saying that security assistance and White House meeting are conditioned on investigations? And the response by Ambassador Sondland, call me. Well, you know what that means, right? You get a text message that's putting it in black and white. Are we saying security assistance and the White House meeting are conditioned on investigations? 
Call me. In other words, don't put this in writing. Call me. Ambassador Taylor did, in fact, call Sondland. Informed by notes he took at the time of the call, he summarized that conversation as follows. During that phone call, Ambassador Sondland told me that President Trump had told him that he wants President Zelensky to state publicly that Ukraine will investigate Burisma and alleged Ukrainian interference in the 2016 election. Ambassador Sondland also told me that he now recognized that he had made a mistake by earlier telling Ukrainian officials that only a White House meeting with President Zelensky was dependent on a public announcement of the investigations. In fact, Ambassador Sondland said, everything was dependent on such an announcement, including security assistance. He said that President Trump wanted President Zelensky in a public box by making a public statement about ordering such investigations. Ambassador Taylor testified that his contemporaneous notes of the call reflect that Sondland used the phrase public box to describe President Trump's desire to ensure that the initiation of his desired investigations was announced publicly. A private commitment was not good enough. The State Department has Ambassador Taylor's extensive notes, and of course, we would like to show them to you to corroborate his testimony. But pursuant to the President's instructions, the State Department will not turn them over. You might recall from the tape yesterday, Ambassador Taylor said, they'll be shortly coming, I'm told. Well, somebody countermanded that instructions. Who do we think that was? But you should see them. If you have any question about what Sondland told Ambassador Taylor, if, if the President's counsel tries to create any confusion about what Sondland told Taylor about his conversation with the President, and look, Sondland had one recollection in his deposition and another recollection in the first hearing and another recollection in the declaration. You want to know exactly what happened in that conversation when it was fresh in Sondland's mind and he told Taylor about it and Taylor wrote it in its notes. You're going to want Taylor's notes. In any courtroom in America holding a fair trial, you would want to see contemporaneous notes. This Senate should be no different. Demand those notes. Demand to see the truth. We're not afraid of those notes. We haven't seen them. We haven't seen them. Maybe those notes say something completely different. Maybe those notes say no quid pro quo. Maybe those notes say it's a perfect call. I'd like to see them. I'm willing to trust Ambassador Taylor's testimony and his recollection. I'd like to see them. I'd like to show them to you. They're yours for the asking. On September 25th, the Washington Post editorial board reported concerns that President Trump was withholding military assistance for U Ukraine in a White House meeting in order to force President Zelensky to announce investigations of Vice President Biden and purported Ukrainian interference in the U.S. election. The Post editorial board wrote, we're reliably told that the president has a second and more venal agenda. He is attempting to force Mr. Zelensky to intervene in the 2020 presidential election by launching an investigation of the leading Democratic candidate, Joe Biden. Mr. Trump is not just soliciting Ukraine's help with, this, with his presidential campaign. He is using U.S. military aid the country desperately needs in an attempt to extort it. So that's September 25th. President on notice, scheme discovered, September 5th. September 7th, the evidence shows President Trump has a call with Ambassador Sondland, where the president made the corrupt bargain for military aid in the White House meeting even more explicit. On September 7th, Ambassador Sondland spoke to President Trump on the telephone. After that conversation, Ambassador Sondland called Tim Morrison, to update him on that conversation. Unlike Sondland, who testified that he never took notes, Morrison took notes of the conversation and recalled it during his public testimony. Let's listen. Now, a few days later, on September 7th, you spoke again to Ambassador Sondland, who told you that he had just gotten off the phone with President Trump. Isn't that right? That, that sounds correct, yes. 
What did Ambassador Sondland tell you that President Trump said to him? Uh, if I recall this conversation correctly, this was where um, Ambassador Sondland related that um, there was no quid pro quo, but President Zelensky had to make the statement and that he had to want to do it. And by that point, did you understand that the statement related to the uh, Biden and 2016 investigations? I, th I think I did, yes. And that that was a, a essentially a condition for the security assistance to be released? I understood that that's what Ambassador Sondland believed. After speaking with President Trump? That's what he represented. Now, you should bear in mind when Mr. Morrison says that's what he represented, that we asked Mr. Morrison about the president's calls with Ambassador Sondland. And he testified that every time he checked to see did Ambassador Sondland, in fact, talk with the president when he said that he did, that yes, in fact, he talked with the president. Every time he checked, he was able to confirm it. Now, let's let this sink in for a minute. According to Mr. Morrison's testimony, former Republican staffer on the Armed Services Committee, he speaks with Sondland on September 7th, and Sondland says he's just gotten off the phone with Trump, okay? So this is contemporaneous. Just got off the phone. Call is fresh in everybody's mind. And what was said? Morrison says, Ambassador Sondland related there was no quid pro quo, but President Zelensky had to make the statement, and he had to want to do it. No quid pro quo, but there's a quid pro quo. Now, there are notes that show this. There's a written record of this. There's a written record of what President Trump told Ambassador Sondland right after that call. Would you like to see that written record? It's called Mr. Morrison's Notes. It's right there for the asking. If these fine lawyers over here want to persuade you that call didn't happen or it wasn't said or all he said was no quid pro quo, he never said, but you have to go to the mic and you have to want to do it. Well, there's a good way to find out what happened on that call because it's in writing. Is there any question why they're withholding this from Congress? Is there any question about that? Uh, they didn't claim, well, Mr. Morrison didn't claim absolute immunity, and Mr. Sondland didn't claim absolute immunity. There's no absolute immunity over these notes, no executive privilege over these notes. The notes have already been described. The conversation's already been released. There's no even plausible, arguable, invented even excuse for withholding these notes. Wouldn't you like to see them? I tell you, in any courtroom in America, you'd get to see them. It should be no different. Wouldn't be any different in a fair trial anywhere in America. Morrison again informed Ambassador Bolton of this September 7th conversation, and guess what Ambassador Bolton said? I think you could probably figure this out by now. Go talk to the lawyers. Go talk to the lawyers. And yet again, for the third time, Morrison went to talk to the lawyers about this conversation with the Master Sondland. Morrison also called Ambassador Taylor to inform him about the conversation, and we have the testimony from Ambassador Taylor about their conversation, which is also based on his contemporaneous notes. Let's look at the conversation now between Mr. Morrison and Ambassador Taylor. According to Mr. Morrison, President Trump told Ambassador Sondland he was not asking for a quid pro quo. But President Trump did insist that President Zelensky go to a microphone and say he is opening investigations of Biden and 2016 election interference, and that President Zelensky should want to do this himself. Okay, so here we have two witnesses taking contemporaneous notes, both reflecting the same conversation. 
conversation between Sondland and the president in which the president says no quid pro quo, but quid pro quo. There are documents that prove this, documents that prove this, that are yours for the asking. The following day, September 8th, Sondland texts Taylor and Volcker to bring them up to speed on the conversations with President Trump and subsequently President Zelensky, whom he spoke to after President Trump. Guys, multiple conversations with Z, meaning Zelensky, POTUS, let's talk. Sondland spoke to Taylor, but not Volcker shortly after this text. Ambassador, according to Ambassador Taylor, who testified again on his real-time notes, Let's hear what, that, what he said. The following day, on September 8th, Ambassador Sondland and I spoke on the phone. He confirmed that he had talked to President Trump, as I had suggested a week earlier, but that P President Trump was adamant that President Zelensky himself had to clear things up and do it in public. President Trump said it was not a quid pro quo. So it's all very consistent here, what the President said. No quid pro quo, but Zelensky must announce the investigations publicly, was what he was telling Sondland. No quid pro quo except for the quid pro quo. The president's attorneys rely on the first half of that sentence and would like you to forget the second half ever happened. But we don't have to leave our common sense at the door. We don't have to rely on an incomplete description of that call. We have instead the detailed notes of Mr. Morrison and Ambassador Taylor. But we also know what President Trump told Sondland because Sondland relayed that message to President Zelensky. During the same September 8 conversation with Taylor, Sondland described his conversation with President Zelensky. Here's Ambassador Taylor's account of it. Ambassador Sondland also said that he had talked to President Zelensky and Mr. Yermak and had told them that although this was not a quid pro quo, President Zelensky did not clear things up in public, we would be at a stalemate. I understood a stalemate to mean that Ukraine would not receive the much needed military assistance. Ambassador Sondland said that this conversation concluded with President Zelensky agreeing to make a public statement in an interview on CNN. So not only did he relate, Ambassador Sondland relate this conversation to Mr. Morrison, and Mr. Taylor, not only did Mr. Taylor, Ambassador Taylor, Mr. Morrison talk about it, but Sondland confirms that he's relayed this conversation to Zelensky himself. Everyone was now in the loop on the military aid being withheld for the political investigations. Taylor continued recalling the startling analogy Ambassador Sondland used to describe President Trump's approach to Ukraine. During our meeting, during our call on September 8th, Ambassador Sondland tried to explain to me that President Trump is a businessman. When a businessman is about to sign a check to someone who owes him something, the businessman asks that person to pay up before signing the check. Ambassador Volker used the same language several days later while we were together at the Yalta European Strategy Conference. I argued to both that the explanation made no sense. The Ukrainians did not owe President Trump anything. Ambassador Taylor testified that at the end of the sondland zelensky conversation, President Zelensky said that he had relented and agreed to do a CNN interview to announce the investigations. So there was a breakthrough after all. The promised meeting wasn't enough. The withheld security assistance broke the logjam. Zelensky was going to go on CNN and announce the investigations. Taylor, though, remained concerned that even if the Ukrainian leader did as President Trump required, President Trump might continue to withhold the vital U.S. security assistance in any event. Ambassador Taylor texted his concerns to Ambassador Volker and Sondland, stating, the nightmare is they give the interview and don't get the security assistance the Russians love it, and I quit. I mean, that's quite telling, too. What's Ambassador Taylor worried about? He's worried the Ukrainians are finally going to agree to do it. They're going to make the announcement, and they're still going to get stiffed on the aid. 
At his deposition, Ambassador Taylor elaborated, the nightmare scenario, the nightmare is the scenario where President Zelensky goes out in public, makes an announcement that he's gonna investigate Burisma and the interference in the 2016 election, maybe among other things, he might put that in some series of investigations, but the nightmare was he would mention those two, take all the heat from that, get himself in big trouble in this country, meaning Ukraine, or this country, meaning the United States, and probably in this country as well, meaning both, I guess, and the security assistance would not be released. That was the nightmare. If it were to happen, Taylor testified he would quit. Early in the morning in Europe on September 9th, which was 12.47 a.m. in Washington, D.C., Ambassador Taylor reiterated his concerns about the President's quid pro quo for security assistance in another series of text messages with Ambassadors Volker and Sondland. So here are the September 9th text messages. Taylor texts to Sondland, the message to the Ukrainians, parentheses, and Russians, we send with the decision on security assistance is key. With the hold, we have already shaken their faith in us. Thus, my nightmare scenario. And Taylor goes on and says, counting on you to be right about this interview, Gordon, meaning if they do it, you darn well better come through with the military aid. And Sondland says, Bill, I never said I was right. I said we are where we are and believe we have identified the best pathway forward. Let's hope it works. And Taylor said, as I said on the phone, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with a political campaign. Ambassador Taylor testified about what he meant. He said that to withhold that assistance for no good reason other than help with a political campaign made no sense. It was counterproductive to all of what we've been trying to do. It was illogical. It could not be explained. It was crazy. In response to Ambassador Taylor's text message, Sondland replies at about 5 a.m. in Washington. So the message from Taylor goes out at 12.47 a.m. The message back from Sondland comes at 5 a.m. So it looks like it may be five hours later. So Taylor has texted at 12.47 a.m. As I said on the phone, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with the political campaign. There he is again putting it in writing for crying out loud. Hadn't Sondland said to call him about this stuff? And so five hours later, you get this really interesting message from Sondland. Bill, I believe you're incorrect about President Trump's intentions. The president has been crystal clear. No quid pro quos of any kind. The president is trying to evaluate whether Ukraine is truly going to adopt the transparency and reforms that President Zelensky promised during his campaign. I suggest we stop the back and forth by text. In other words, can you please stop putting this in writing? Congress may read this one day. If you still have concerns, I recommend you give Lisa Kenna or S a call to discuss them directly. Thanks. Now, as you can see, Ambassador Sondland's subsequent testimony revealed that this text and other denials of a quid pro quo were intentionally false and simply designed to provide a written record of a false explanation that could later be used to conceal wrongdoing. The text message says there were no quid pro quos of any kind, but you've seen his testimony. He swore under oath he was crystal clear when he said there was a quid pro quo for the White House meeting, and he subsequently testified there was a quid pro quo for the security assistance as well, as confirmed by President Trump's direction to him on September 7. Sondland's recollection of his conversation with President Trump, as I mentioned, has evolved over time. Initially in his deposition, he testified that the conversation with the President occurred between Taylor's text of September 9th at 1247, Washington time and his response at 5 a.m. He recalled very little of the conversation at that time other than his belief that his text message reflected President Trump's response. Subsequently, though, and again, this is one of the reasons why you do depositions in closed session. Subsequently, after the opening statements of the testimony of Ambassador Taylor and Mr. Morrison were released, which described in overlapping and painful detail Sondland's conversation with President Trump on September 7th, Ambassador Sondland submitted an addendum 
to his deposition testimony, which in relevant part said this. Finally, as of this writing, I cannot specifically recall if I had one or two calls, phone calls with President Trump in the September 6 to 9 time frame. Despite repeated, repeated requests to the White House and the State Department, I have not been granted access to all of the phone records, and I would like to review those phone records along with any other notes and other documents that may exist to determine if I can provide a more complete testimony to assist Congress. However, although I have no specific recollection of phone calls during this period with Mr. Taylor, Ambassador Taylor, Mr. Morrison, I have no reason to question the substance of their recollection about my September 1 conversation with Mr. Yermak. During his public testimony, Ambassador Sondland purported to remember more of this conversation with President Trump. Although he stood, still couldn't or maintained he couldn't remember if it was on September 7th or September 9th. And according to his testimony, President Trump did not specifically say there was a quid pro quo, but when Sondland simply asked the President what he wanted from Ukraine, President Trump immediately brought up a quid pro quo. According to Sondland, President Trump said, I want nothing, I want no quid pro quo, I want Zelensky to do the right thing. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, I want him to do what he ran on. In his subsequent testimony, Ambassador Sondland explained that President Trump's reference to what he ran on was a nod to rooting out corruption. Here, however, corruption like Burisma has become code for the investigations that President Trump has sought. So you've got Ambassador Sondland's emerging recollection. But what you've got is actually written notes taken at the time that he does not contest. Written notes of Ambassador Taylor and Mr. Morrison. Notes which I believe will reflect quite clearly the understanding of dirt for dollars that was confirmed by this telephone call with President Trump. Well, you weren't dissuaded then, right? Because you still thought that the aid was conditioned on the public announcement of the investigations after speaking to President Trump. By September 8th, I was absolutely convinced it was. And President Trump did not dissuade you of that in the conversation I, that you acknowledged you had with him? I don't ever recall because that would have changed my entire calculus. If President Trump had told me directly, I'm not That's not what I'm this. asking, Ambassador Sondland. I'm just saying, you still believed that the security assistance was conditioned on the investigation after you spoke to President Trump. Yes or no? From a time frame standpoint, yes. Okay, so, so here we have Sondland saying that whatever his recollection may be about that call, he was still very clear what the president wanted, and he was very clear there was a quid pro quo. That is consistent, obviously, with what Mr. Morrison has had to say and Ambassador Taylor. In other words, he didn't believe President Trump's denial of a quid pro quo, and neither should you. Sondland's understanding was further confirmed by President Trump's own chief of staff. On October, October 17, at a press briefing in the White House, Mick Mulvaney admitted that President Trump withheld the essential military aid for Ukraine as leverage to pressure Ukraine to investigate the conspiracy theory that Ukraine had interfered in the 2016 election. So um, that was, those were the driving factors. Did he also mention to me in the past that the, 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 the corruption related to the DNC server? Absolutely, no question about that. Um, but that's it, and that's why we held up the money. When pressed that he had just convinced of the very quid pro quo that President Trump had been denying, Mulvaney doubled down. Let's listen to that. But to be clear, what you just described is a quid pro quo. It is funding will not flow unless the investigation into the, into the Democratic server uh, happens as well. We, we, do, we do that all the time with foreign policy. This evidence demonstrates that President Trump withheld the security assistance in the White House meeting with President Zelensky until Ukraine made a public statement announcing the two investigations targeted to help his political reelection efforts. But as you will learn next, he got caught and the cover up ensued.
Mr. Chief Justice and Senators, thank you for your patience. This is a lot of information, but you have a very important obligation, and that is ultimately to decide whether the President committed impeachable offenses. And in order to make that judgment, you have to have all of the facts. And so we're going through this chronology. We're close to being done. But it's important to know that uh, while all of this material was going on, these deals were being made, there were other forces at work. Even before the President's freeze on U.S. military assistance to Ukraine became public on August 28th, members of both houses of Congress began to express concern. On August 9th, the Democratic leadership of the House and Senate Appropriations Committee <clears throat> wrote to the OMB and the White House warning that a hold on assistance might constitute an illegal impoundment of funds. They urged the Trump administration to follow the law and obligate the funding. When the news of the frozen aid broke, on August 28th, congressional scrutiny of President Trump's decision increased. On September 3rd, a group of senators, both Republicans and Democrats, including Senator Gene Shaheen, Senator Rob Portman, Senator Dick Durbin, Senator Ron Johnson, Senator Richard Blumenthal, sent a letter to acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney expressing and I quote, deep concerns that the administration is considering not obligating the Ukraine Security Initiative Funds for 2000, uh, 2019. Two days later, as has been mentioned, on September 5th, a Washington Post editorial expressed concern that President Trump was, was withholding military assistance to Ukraine in order to pressure President Zelensky to announce these investigations. That was the first public report linking the frozen security aid to the investigations that Mr. Giuliani had been publicly pressing for and that President Trump, uh, Trump as we've heard, had privately urged President Zelensky to conduct on the July 25th call. That same day, Senators Murphy and Johnson met with President Zelensky in Kiev Ambassador Taylor went with them, and he testified, Mr. Taylor testified, that President Zelensky's, quote, first question to the senators was about withheld security assistance. Ambassador Taylor testified that both senators, quote, stressed that bipartisan support for Ukraine and Washington was Ukraine's most important strategic asset, and that President Zelensky should not jeopardize that bipartisan support by getting drawn into U.S. domestic politics. Now, Senator Johnson and Senator Murphy later submitted letters where they explained that they sought to reassure President Zelensky that there was bipartisan support in Congress for providing Ukraine with military assistance and that they would continue to urge President Trump to lift the hold. Here is what they said in that letter. Senator Murphy said, Senator Johnson and I assured Zelensky that Congress wanted to continue this funding and would press Trump to release it immediately. And Senator Johnson in the letter said, I explained that I'd tried to persuade the president to authorize me to announce the hold was released, but that I was unsuccessful. Now, as news of the president's hold on military assistance to Ukraine became public at the end of August, Congress, the press, the public started to pay more attention to President Trump's activities with Ukraine. This risked exposing the scheme that you've heard so much about today. By now, the White House had learned that the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community had found that a whistleblower complaint related to the same Ukraine matter was, quote, credible and, quote, an urgent concern and was therefore, uh, that they were therefore required to send that 
complaint to Congress. On September 9th, three House investigating committees sent a letter to White House counsel Pat Cipollone stating that President Trump and Giuliani, quote, appear to have acted outside, pres outside legitimate law enforcement and diplomatic channels to coerce the Ukrainian government into pursuing two politically motivated investigations under the guise of anti-corruption activity. The letter also said this, if the president is trying to pressure Ukraine into choosing between defending itself from a Russian aggression without U.S. assistance or leveraging its judicial system to serve the ends of the Trump campaign, this would represent a staggering abuse of power, a boon to Moscow and a betrayal of the public trust. The chairs requested that the White House preserve all relevant records and produce them by September 16th. This included the transcript, or actually the call record, of the July 25th call between President Trump and President Zelensky. Now, based on witness testimony, it looks like the White House Counsel's Office circulated the committee's document request around the White House. Tim Morrison, a senior director at the National Security Council, remembered seeing a copy of this letter. He also recalled that the three committee's Ukraine investigation was discussed at a meeting of senior level NSC staff soon after it was publicly announced. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman recalled discussions about, uh, among the NSC staff members that the investigation, and here is a quote, might have the effect of releasing the hold on Ukraine military assistance because it would be, quote, potentially politically challenging for the administration to justify that hold to Congress. Later that same day on September 9th, the Inspector General informed the House and Senate Intelligence Committees he determined that the whistleblower complaint that had been submitted on, Oct on August 12th appeared to be credible, met the definition of urgent concern under the statute, and yet he reported that for the first time ever, the acting director of national intelligence was withholding this whistleblower complaint from Congress. That violated the law, which required him to send it in seven days. The acting director later testified that his office initially withheld the complaint based on the advice from the White House and an unprecedented intervention by the Department of Justice. Now, according to public reporting and testimony from the acting DNI at a hearing before the House Intelligence Committee on September 26th, the White House had been aware of the whistleblower complaint for weeks prior to the IG's September 9th letter to the Intelligence Committees. Acting DNI McGuire testified that when he received the whistleblower complaint from the Inspector General, his office contacted the White House Counsel's Office for guidance. Consistent with acting DNI McGuire's testimony, the New York Times has reported that in late August, the President's current defense counsel, Mr. Cipollone, and NSC lawyer John Eisenberg personally briefed President Trump about the complaint's existence and told the President they believed the complaint could be withheld from Congress on executive privilege grounds. Now, on September 10th, the next day, Ambassador Bolton resigned from his position as National Security Advisor. On that same day, September 10th, Chairman Schiff of the House Intelligence Committee wrote a letter to the acting director demanding that he provide the complaint as the law required. The next day, on September 11th, President Trump lifted the hold on the security existence uh, to Ukraine. Now, numerous witnesses have testified that they weren't aware of any reason why the hold was lifted, just as there was no explanation for the hold being implemented. There was no additional review, no additional European contribution, nothing to justify the president's change in position except he got caught. Just as there was no official explanation for why the hold on Ukrainian assistance was implemented, 
Numerous witnesses testified that they were not provided with any reason for why the hold was lifted on September 11th. For example, Jennifer Williams, who was the special advisor to Vice President Pence, testified that she was never given a reason for that decision. Neither was Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. Here's what he told us during the hearing. Are you also aware, however, that the security assistance hold was not lifted for another 10 days after this meeting? That's correct. And am I correct that you ne didn't learn the reason why the hold was lifted? That's correct. Uh, Colonel Vindman, you didn't learn a reason why the hold was lifted either, is that right? Correct. Colonel Vindman, are you aware that the committees launched an investigation into Ukraine matters on September 9th, two days before the hold was lifted? I am aware, and I was aware. Ambassador Taylor, the person in charge at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev, who communicated the decision to the Ukrainians, also never got an explanation. Here's what he said. Are you also aware, however, that the security assistance hold was not lifted for another 10 days after this ninth. Finally, on September 11th, I learned that the hold had been lifted and security assistance would be provided. I was not told the reason why the hold had been lifted. Mark Sandy, a career officer at OMB, testified he only learned of a possible rationale for the hold in early September after the acting DNI had informed the White House about the whistleblower complaint. Now, Sandy testified that sometime in early September, he received an email from his boss, Michael Duffy. Approximately two months after the hold had been placed, the email, quote, attributed the hold to the president's concern about other countries not contributing more to Ukraine and requested, quote, information about what additional countries were contributing to Ukraine. This was a different explanation than OMB had provided at the July 26th interagency meeting that referenced concerns about corruption. Lieutenant Colonel testified that none of the facts on the ground about Ukrainian efforts to combat corruption or other countries' contribution to Ukraine had changed before President Trump lifted the hold. According to a press report, after Congress began investigating President Trump's scheme, the White House Counsel's Office opened an internal investigation relating to the July 25th call. The following slides provide excerpts from a report in the Washington Post. As part of that internal investigation, White House lawyers reportedly gathered and reviewed hundreds of documents that reveal extensive efforts to generate an after-the-fact justification for the hold on military assistance for Ukraine that had been ordered by the president. These documents reportedly include, quote, early August uh, email exchanges between Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney and White House budget officials seeking to provide an explanation for withholding the funds after the president had already ordered a hold in mid-July on the nearly $400 million in security assistance. The Washington Post article also reported that, and this, this is a quote, emails show OMB director Vought and OMB staffers arguing that withholding the aid was legal while officials at the National Security Council and State Department protested. OMB lawyers said that it was legal to withhold the aid as long as they deemed it a temporary hold. You should be able to see these documents, but the White House has withheld them from Congress. So the House can't verify the news report, but you could. You, you, you could do that if you could see these documents. You should subpoena them and there's no reason not to see all the relevant documents. Now, the lengthy delay created by President Trump's hold prevented the Department of Defense from spending all congressionally appropriated funds by the end of the fiscal year, as we've mentioned before. That meant the funds were going to expire on September 30th because, as we know, unused funds do not roll over 
to the next fiscal year. This confirmed the fears expressed by Cooper, Sandy, and others, concerns that were discussed within the relevant agencies in late July and throughout August, approximately, ultimately, $35 million of Ukraine military assistance, that's 14 percent of the DOD funds, remained unspent by the end of the fiscal year in order to make sure that Ukraine did not permanently lose the $35 million of critical military assistance that had been frozen by the White House, Congress had to pass a provision on September 27th, three days before the funds were to expire, to ensure that the remaining $35 million uh, could be sent to U Ukraine. Now, George Kent is an anti-corruption and rule of law expert. He told us that American anti-corruption efforts pri prioritize building institutional capacity, support for the rule of law, not the pursuit of individual investigations, particularly of political rivals. Here's how he explained their approach. U.S. efforts to counter corruption in Ukraine focus on building institutional capacity so that the Ukrainian government has the ability to go after corruption and effectively investigate, prosecute, and judge alleged criminal activities using appropriate institutional mechanisms. That is, to create and follow the rule of law. That means that if there are criminal nexuses for activity in the United States, U.S. law enforcement should pursue the case. If we think there has been a criminal act overseas that violates U.S. law, we have the institutional mechanisms to address that. It could be through the Justice Department and FBI agents assigned overseas, or through treaty mechanisms, such as the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty. As a general principle, I do not believe the United States should ask other countries to engage in selective politically associated investigations or prosecutions against opponents of those in power, because such selective actions undermine the rule of law, regardless of the country. Now, David Holmes concurred during his testimony. Holmes also compared the official approach that we believe in, that we uh, promulgate across the world, with what the President and Mr. Giuliani actually were doing. So our longstanding policy is to encourage them to establish and build uh, rule of law institutions that are capable and that are independent and that can actually pursue credible allegations. Uh, that's our policy. We've been doing that for quite some time with some success. Um, so focusing on particular cases, including particular cases where there is a, a, a interest of the president's, um, it's just not part of what we've done. Uh, it's hard to explain why uh, we would do that. Unfortunately, we do know the explanation. We know why President Trump wanted President Zelensky to announce investigations because it would help him in his election. Now, on September 18th, approximately a week before he was supposed to meet with President Trump at the United Nations General Assembly in New York, President Zelensky spoke by telephone with Vice President Pence. During her deposition, Jennifer Williams testified, and she is the, was Vice President Pence's um, assistant. She uh, testified that P Vice President Pence basically reiterated that the hold on aid had been lifted and asked a bit more about how Zelensky's efforts were going. Now, following her deposition and while preparing for her testimony at the open hearing on November 19th, Williams reviewed the documents. They've not been produced to us by the White House. And those documents refreshed her recollection of Vice President Pence's call with President Zelensky. Now, the White House blocked Williams from testifying about her refreshed recollections of the Vice President's call when she appeared at the open public hearing. They claimed that certain portions of the September 8th, 18th call, including the information that Williams wanted to tell us about, were classified. On November 26th, she submitted a classified addition to her hearing testimony, where she provided additional information about the Vice President's September 18th telephone call with President Zelensky. The Intelligence Committee provided this classified addition to the Judiciary Committee. 
It has been sent to the Senate for your review. Now, I've read that testimony. I'll just say that a cover-up is not a proper reason to classify a document. Vice President Pence has repeatedly said publicly that he has no objection to the White House releasing the actual transcript of his calls with President Zelensky, and yet his office has refused many requests by the committee to declassify Williams' addendum so the American people could also see the additional evidence about this call. We urge the senators to review it, and we ask again that the White House declassify it. As the House wrote in two separate letters, there is no basis to keep it classified. And again, in case the White House needs a reminder, it's improper to keep something classified just to avoid embarrassment or to conceal wrongdoing. Now, we've been through uh, a lot of facts today. We've seen uh, the president's scheme, a shakedown of Ukraine for his personal benefit, uh, was, I believe, an obvious abuse of his power. But this misconduct, the scheme, became exposed. Congress asked questions. The press reported. Non-political officers in the government expressed concern. The whistleblower laws were activated. As this happened, there was an effort to create an after-the-fact misleading record to avoid responsibility for what the president had actually been doing. These were not the only efforts to hide misconduct, and the misconduct continued. Congressman Schiff will review some of those items. So we have about 20 minutes left in the presentation uh, tonight. I'd like to now go through with you the President's efforts to hide this corrupt scheme, even as it continued well into the fall of last year. On August 12th, a whistleblower in the intelligence community submitted a complaint addressed to the Congressional Intelligence Committees. This explosive document stated that President Trump had solicited foreign interference from Ukraine to assist in his 2020 reelection bid. The complaint alleged a scheme by President Trump to quote, use the power of his office to solicit interference from a foreign country in the 2020 U.S. election. The complaint stated that the president had applied pressure on Ukraine to investigate one of the president's main domestic political rivals and detailed the involvement of the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. The complaint also stated that the whistleblower believed that the president's activities, quote, pose risk to U.S. national security and undermine the U.S. government's efforts to deter and counter foreign interference in U.S. elections. Under the law, the whistleblower was required to file the complaint with the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, which was then required to vet and assess the complaint and determine if it warranted reporting to the Intelligence Committees. The law gives the Inspector General 14 days to conduct an initial review and then inform the Director of National Intelligence about his findings. On August 26, the Inspector General sent the whistleblower complaint and the Inspector General's preliminary determination to the Acting Director of National Intelligence. The Inspector General wrote that based on a review, his review of the complaint, its allegations constituted an urgent concern and appeared credible under the statute. The Inspector General confirmed that the whistleblower acted lawfully in bringing the complaint and credibly raised a legitimate concern that should be communicated to the Intelligence Committees of Congress. The Director of National Intelligence quickly informed the White House about the complaint. Under the law, the Acting Director of National Intelligence was required to forward the complaint and the Inspector General's determination to the Congressional Intelligence Committees no later than seven days after he received it. The legal requirement is extremely clear. 
Upon receipt of the transmittal from the ICIG, that is the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, the director shall, within seven calendar days of such receipt, forward such transmittal to the Congressional Intelligence Committees together with any comments the director considers appropriate. Yet, despite the clear letter of the law, the White House mobilized to keep the information in the whistleblower complaint from Congress, including by inviting the Department of Justice to render an opinion as to whether the complaint could be withheld from Congress. The statutory deadline of September 2nd, when the inspector, when the Director of National Intelligence was required to turn it over to Congress, came and went, and the complaint remained hidden from Congress. Finally, on September 9th, a full week after the complaint was required to be sent to Congress, and once again, an urgent concern, the Inspector General, one week after it was required to be sent to Congress, the Inspector General wrote to the leaders of the intelligence committees to inform them that the Director of National Intelligence was withholding a whistleblower complaint in direct contravention of past practice and the law. On September 24th, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi announced that the House of Representatives is moving forward with an official impeachment inquiry. The next day, the House of Representatives passed a resolution calling on the Trump administration to provide the whistleblower's complaint immediately to the Congressional Intelligence Committees. Later that day, the White House publicly released the summary of the July 25th call between President Trump and President Zelensky and permitted the acting Director of National Intelligence to provide the whistleblower's complaint and related to documents to the Congressional Intelligence Committees. The President himself was happy to discuss the motivations for the scheme in public. That day, in a joint press availability with President Zelensky at the United Nations General Assembly, President Trump reiterated that he wanted Ukraine to investigate the Bidens. To do more on Joe Biden and investigate. No, I want uh, him to do whatever he can. This was not his fault. He wasn't there. He's just been here recently. But whatever he can do in terms of corruption, because the corruption's massive. Now, when Biden's son walks away with millions of dollars from Ukraine and he knows nothing, and they're paying him millions of dollars, that's corruption. When Biden Finally, the day after President Trump explained to the public that he wanted Ukraine to investigate former, President, Vice Pres former Vice President Biden, on the morning of September 26th, the Intelligence Committee publicly released declassified redactions of two documents, the whistleblower's August 12th complaint and the Inspector General's August 26th transmittal to the Acting Director of National Intelligence. Even after the impeachment inquiry into the Ukraine matter began, President Trump and his proxy, Rudy Giuliani, have continued to publicly urge President Zelensky to launch an investigation of Vice President Biden and alleged 2016 election interference by Ukraine. On September 30, during his remarks at the swearing-in of the new Labor Secretary, President Trump stated, Now, the new president of Ukraine ran on the basis of no corruption. That's how he got elected. And I believe that he really means it. But there was a lot of corruption having to do with the 2016 election against us. And we want to get to the bottom of it. And it's very important that we do. Thank you very much. So here he is. This meeting at the United Nations, September 30. And he's still pursuing this bogus crowd strike conspiracy theory with the president of Ukraine. On October 7, uh, 2nd, in a public press availability, President Trump discussed the July 25th call with President Zelensky and stated the conversation was perfect, it couldn't have been nicer. He then linked his notion of corruption with the Biden investigation. On October 3rd, in remarks before he departed on Marine One, President Trump expressed his hope that Ukraine would investigate Vice President Biden and his son. President Trump actually escalated his rhetoric, urging not only Ukraine to investigate the Bidens, but China too. Well, I would think that if they were honest about it, they'd start a major investigation into the Biden. It's a very simple answer. Uh, they should investigate the Bidens, because how does a company 
that's newly formed and all these companies, if you look at, and by the way, likewise, China should start an investigation into the Biden. Because what happened in China is just about as bad as what happened with, uh, with Ukraine. So I would say that President Zelensky, if it were me, I would recommend that they start an investigation into the Bidens. The same day, President Trump tweeted that he has an absolute right to investigate corruption. That really means is he feels he has an absolute right to investigate or get foreign countries to investigate his political opponents. The president sent a similar tweet the next day, once again linking corruption with the Biden investigation. As president, I have an obligation to end corruption, even if that means requesting the help of a foreign country or countries. It is done all the time. This has nothing to do with politics or a political campaign against the Bidens. This does have to do with corruption. Give him credit for being so obvious. This has nothing to do with politics or a political campaign against the Bidens, but you got to investigate the Bidens. I guess that's just a coincidence. President Trump continued to demonstrate his eagerness to solicit foreign assistance related to his personal interest. Here's what's okay. He said, if we feel there's corruption, like I feel there was in the 2016 campaign, there was tremendous corruption against me. If we feel there's corruption, we have a right to go to a foreign country. President Trump added that asking President Xi of China to investigate the Bidens is certainly something we can start thinking about. Even last month, even last month, the President and Giuliani's scheme continued. During the first week of December, Giuliani traveled to Budapest Kiev and Vienna to meet with the former Ukrainian government officials as part of a continuing effort to dig up dirt, political dirt, on Vice President Biden and advance the theory that Ukraine interfered in the 2016 election. Asked about his interviews of foreign Ukrainian prosecutors, Giuliani told the New York Times that he was acting on behalf of his client, President Trump. Quote, like a good lawyer, I am gathering evidence to defend my client against the false charges being leveled against him. Indeed, evidence obtained by the House from Giuliani's associate confirms that he had been representing himself in as early as May 2019 as President Trump's personal lawyer, doing Donald J. Trump's personal bidding in his dealings with Ukraine. This letter, May 10th, 2019, from Giuliani to Zelensky, says, among other things, However, I have a more specific request. In my capacity as personal counsel to President Trump and with his knowledge and consent, I request a meeting with you on this upcoming Monday, May 13th or Tuesday, May 14th. I will need no more than a half an hour of your time and I will be accompanied by my colleague, Victoria Tensing, a distinguished American attorney who is very familiar with this matter. Please have your office let me know what time or times are convenient for you, and Victoria and I will be there. So this is evidence recently obtained showing his effort to get that meeting in May with Zelensky. Giuliani told the Wall Street Journal that when he returned to New York from this most recent trip on December 7th, President Trump called him as his plane was still taxiing down the runway. What did you get? He said President Trump asked. More than you can imagine, Giuliani replied. Giuliani claimed that he was putting his findings into a 20-page report that the president had asked him to brief the attorney general and the Republicans in Congress. Shortly thereafter, on the same day, President Trump told reporters before departing on Marine One that he was aware of Giuliani's efforts in Ukraine and that Giuliani was going to report his purported findings to the attorney general and Congress. I just know he came back from some place and he's going to make a report, I think, to the Attorney General and to Congress. He says he has a lot of good information. I have not spoken to him about that information, but Rudy, as you know, has been one of the great crime fighters of the last 50 years. And he did get back from Europe just recently. And I know he has not told me what he's found, 
but I think he wants to go before Congress and say, and also to the Attorney General and the Department of Justice, I hear he's found plenty. Yeah. Three days after that, uh, those remarks on December 10th, Giuliani confirmed to the Washington Post that President Trump had asked him to brief the Justice Department and Republican senators on his, quote, findings, unquote, from his trip to Ukraine. Giuliani stated, he wants me to do it. I'm working on pulling it together and hope to have it done by the end of the week. That Friday, December 13th, Giuliani reportedly met with President Trump at the White House. And on December 17th, Giuliani confirmed to CNN that President Trump has been very supportive of his efforts to dig up dirt on Vice President Biden in Ukraine and that they are on the same page. The following day, on December 18, 2019, the House of Representatives approved the two articles of impeachment you are considering in this trial. Since the House voted on these articles, evidence has continued to come to light related to the President's corrupt scheme. Among other things, Freedom of Information Act lawsuits, press reporting and documents provided to Congressman Rudy Giuliani, Associate Lev Parnas, further corroborate what we already know about the President's scheme. As Giuliani again said on December 17th, President Trump has been, quote, very supportive, unquote, of his efforts to dig up dirt on Vice President Biden, and they are, quote, on the same page. Parnas further corroborated what we already know about President Trump's scheme, that he was responsible for withholding military aid and sustaining that hold, and that his personal attorney, Mr. Giuliani, was working at the direction of President Trump himself. On December 20th, new emails were released showing that 91 minutes after President Trump's call with the Ukrainian President Zelensky, a top Office of Management and Budget aide asked the Department of Defense to withhold, to hold off on sending military aid to Ukraine. So those were new documents that came on December 20th. On December 29th, revelations emerged from OMB Director and Acting Chief of Staff McMulvaney's role about them, about that role in the delay of aid and efforts by lawyers at OMB, the Department of Justice, and the White House to justify the delay and the alarm that the delay caused within the administration. Those records just became available on December 29th. On January 2nd, newly unredacted Pentagon emails, which raised serious concerns by Trump administration officials about the legality of the president's hold on aid, became available. On January 6th, Former Trump National Security Advisor John Bolton announced that he would comply with a Senate subpoena compelling his testimony. His lawyers stated that he has new relevant information. On January 13th, reports emerged that the Russian government hacked the Ukrainian gas company Burisma, almost certainly in an effort to find information about Vice President Joe Biden's son in order to weaponize that information against Mr. Biden and in favor of Mr. Trump, just as Russia did against Secretary Clinton in favor of then-candidate Trump in 2016. That brings us up to January 13th of this year. Last week, House committees received new evidence from Lev Parnas that further demonstrates that the President was a central player in this scheme to pressure Ukraine for his political gain. And also last week, the Government Accountability Office found that President Trump violated the law when he withheld that aid. Last night, we had a further development when more redacted emails from the Office of Management and Budget were produced. I think Representative Crow showed you these. These are among the documents that were just released. I'm sure that if we could read under those redactions, it would be a very perfect email. But you have to ask, what is being redacted here? What is so important to keep confidential during the course of an impeachment inquiry? As you can see, right up until last night, evidence continues to be produced. The truth is going to come out. Indeed, the truth has already come out, but more and more of it will. 
More emails are going to come out. More witnesses are going to come forward. They're going to have more relevant information to share. And the only question is, <clears throat> do you want to hear it now? You want to know the full truth now? You want to know just who was in the loop? Sounds like everyone was in the loop. You want to know how broad the scheme was? We have the evidence to prove that President Trump ordered the aid withheld. He did so to coerce Ukraine to help his reelection campaign. He withheld a White House meeting to coerce the same sham investigations. We can and will prove President Trump guilty of this conduct and of obstructing the investigation into his misconduct. But you and the American people should know who else was involved in this scheme. You should want the whole truth to come out. You should want to know about every player in this sordid business. It isn't within your power to do so. And I would urge you, even if you're prepared to vote to convict and impeach and remove this president, to find out the full truth about how far this corruption goes. Because I think the public has a right to know. Now, today, well, yesterday we made the case for why you should hear this additional evidence and testimony. This morning, I introduced you to the broad sweep of the president's conduct. And then during the course of today, we walked you through a factual chronology uh, in real time about how this plot unfolded. And during that factual chronology today, you saw that in March of this year, Giuliani began that smear campaign against Ambassador Yovanovitch in order to get her fired by President Trump, something he would later admit was necessary to get her out of the way because she was going to be in the way of these two investigations. This is the supposed anti-corruption effort by the president to get rid of a woman who has dedicated her career to representing the United States, often in dangerous parts of the world, to fighting corruption and to promoting the rule of law. This plot begins with getting her out of the way, with the president saying that she's going to go through some things. This anti-corruption reformer, this U.S. patriot, this plot begins with getting her out of the way. And tellingly, and this says so much, about the administration. Tellingly, it wasn't enough just to recall her or fire her. The president could have done that, done that any time. No, they wanted to destroy her because she had the audacity to stand in their way. So we heard in March about the effort to get rid of her, and it succeeded. And guess what message that sent to the Ukrainians? about the power the president's lawyer has. The Ukrainians were watching this whole saga. They were hearing his interviews. They were seeing the smears that he was putting out. And this attorney for the president, working hand in hand with these corrupt Ukrainians, was able to get a U.N. ambassador yanked out of her job. Proof positive, you want a window to this president, you want to entree to this president, you want to make things happen with this president, you go through his lawyer. Never mind the State Department, never mind the National Security Council, never mind the Defense Department, you go through his lawyer. That's March. April, Zelensky has this huge victory in the presidential election. He gets a congratulatory call from the president. The president assigns Vice President Pence to go to the inauguration. May, Giuliani is rebuffed by Zelensky, cancels the trip to Ukraine, the one where he wanted to go, remember, meddle in the investigation. Because, Giuliani says, enemies of Trump surround Zelensky. 
I guess that means he didn't get the meeting and they must be enemies of the president. Of course, the Ukrainians know why he wants that meeting. May, Trump disinvites Pence to the inauguration. Pence is going. Giuliani's rebuffed. Pence ain't going. That's May. Instead, May 23rd, we have this meeting at the White House, and there's a new, a new party in town, the Three Amigos. They're going to be handling the Ukraine portfolio. And they're told, work with Rudy. Work with Rudy. Ambassador Sondland, Ambassador Volker, Secretary Perry. Work with Rudy. And as you saw in June, Giuliani's pushing for these investigations. And they're trying to arrange these meetings and trying to make this happen. And also in June, the Defense Department announces they're going to release the military aid. And the President reads about this. And then he stops it. He stops the aid. In July, on July 10th, you heard in the chronology, there's that meeting at the White House. The meeting in which Sondland blurts out in this meeting between Ukrainians and Americans, hey, they've got a deal. They're trying to get this meeting, and there's a debate about whether the meeting is going to happen and when it's going to happen, and Sondland says, hey, we've got a deal with Mulvaney here. We're going to get this meeting, and you're going to do those investigations. And Bolton stiffens and abruptly ends the meeting. That was the first meeting that day, and then Sondland brings the delegation to a different part of the White House, and they have the follow-up meeting where he makes it even more explicit. This drug deal is made even more explicit. And Dr. Hill is told by Ambassador Bolton, you need to go talk to the lawyers. I don't want any part of this drug deal they're cooking up. That's July. July is the month where that email goes from Sondland to Pompeo and others, and everybody is in the loop. July is the month where the hold is implemented with no explanation. July is the month where Mueller testifies about Russia's systemic interference in our affairs. July is the month after Mueller testifies that the president believes he has escaped accountability. The next day in July is, of course, the July 25th call, in which the president asks for his favor. And July is the month, July 26 is the date of the call between President Trump and Ambassador Sondland. You know the one. Zelensky loves your ass. He'll do anything you want. Is he going to do the investigation? Yeah, he's going to do the investigation. July is the month of that conversation between Sondland and David Holmes, where Holmes says, can you, can you tell me candidly here what the president thinks of Ukraine? Does he give a blank about Ukraine? No, he doesn't give a blank about Ukraine. He only cares about the big stuff. Well, there's kind of big stuff here in Ukraine, like a war with the Russians. No, no, no. Big stuff that affects him personally, like the Biden investigation that Giuliani wants. That's the month of July. August, we have that meeting between Giuliani and Yermak in Madrid. August, we have the back and forth about the statement. No, you go first. And you commit and publicly announce the investigations, and then we'll give you a date. No, you go first. You give us the date, and then we'll announce the investigations. Well, we'll give you a statement that doesn't mention the specifics. No, no, you give us a statement that mentions the investigations. Investigations, that's the month of August. August is also the month where it becomes clear that it's not just the meeting anymore. It's everything. Everything is conditioned on these investigations. The relationship, the money, the meeting. Sondland and Holmes testify. It's as simple as 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's August. September, Sondland says to Yermak, everything is conditioned on public announcements. So message delivered, no ambiguity. The Ukrainians are told quid pro quo. Taylor texts, this is crazy, to withhold aid. 
September is the month, September 7th in particular, Trump and Sondland talk on the phone, and the president has that conversation where he says, no quid pro quo, except here's the quid pro quo. Zelensky's got to go to the mic, and what's more, he should want to do it. September is also the month where the investigations begin in Congress. September's the month where after those investigations begin, after the president knows he's been caught, the aid is finally released. And September is the month where Pence and Zelensky are on the phone and Jennifer Williams has classified information to share with you that I hope you will take a look at because it is relevant to these issues. That's September. October, Trump admits, yes, if it wasn't obvious enough, he wants Ukraine to investigate his political opponent. October is the month where he invites another nation, China, to investigate his opponent. This is the broad outline of the chronology that we went through today. Tomorrow, we will go through the law, the Constitution, and the facts as they apply to Article I. That is the plan for tomorrow. We've introduced the case, we've gone through the chronology, and tomorrow we will apply the facts to the law as it pertains to the President's abuse of power. And let me just uh, conclude this evening by remarking again on what brought us here. What brought us here is that some courageous people came forward. Courageous people that risked their entire careers. And one of the things that's been so striking to me about that is I watch these witnesses like Maria Yovanovitch and Ambassador Taylor and David Holmes and others, Dr. Hill, is how much these dedicated officials were willing to risk their career the beginning of their career, or the middle of their career, or late in their career, when they had everything to lose. But people senior to them who have every advantage, who sit in positions of power, lack that same basic commitment, lack that same basic willingness to put their country first and expose wrongdoing. Why is it that Colonel Vindman, who worked for Fiona Hill, who worked for John Bolton and Dr. Kupperman, why is it that they were willing to stick their neck out and answer lawful subpoenas when their bosses wouldn't? I don't know that I can answer that question, but I just can tell you I have such admiration for the fact they did. I think, and, 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 I, and I think this is some form of cosmic justice, that this ambassador that was so ruthlessly smeared is now a hero for her courage. There is justice in that. But what will really vindicate that leap of faith that she took is if we show the same courage. They risked everything, their careers. And yes, I know what you're asked to decide may risk yours too. But if they could show the courage, so can we. I yield back. Uh, pursuant to the provisions of Senate Resolution 243 of the 100th Congress, 
a single one-page classified document identified by the House managers for filing with the Secretary of the Senate that will be received on January 22, 2020, shall not be made part of the public record and shall not be printed, but shall be made available pursuant to the standing order from the 100th Congress. The Majority Leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, colleagues, we're almost through for the evening. Uh, we'll convene again at 1 o'clock uh, tomorrow. Before we adjourn, I'd like to acknowledge that tomorrow is the official last day for this term Senate pages. This group of... <laughs> in, in addition to witnessing this uh, unusual event that we're all experiencing, they're, they're studying for their final exams as well, and we wish them well as they head off uh, back to boring, normal high school. Uh, Mr. Leader, let me just add my thanks and gratitude for all of us. It is rare, particularly these days, when 100 senators from both sides of the aisle of every political persuasion get up and give someone a standing ovation. <laughs> But you deserve it. Thank you for your good work, and we hope you have beautiful and successful lives. <clears throat> so, Mr. Uh, Chief Justice, I ask unanimous consent that on Tuesday, January the 28th, from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., while the Senate is sitting as a court of impeachment, and that notwithstanding the Senate's adjournment, <clears throat> the Senate can receive House messages and executive matters committees be authorized to report legislation and executive matters, and senators be allowed to submit statements for the record, bills, resolutions, and co-sponsor requests, and where applicable, the Secretary of the Senate on behalf of the printing of the presiding officer be permitted to refer such matters. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, finally, I ask unanimous consent that the trial adjourn until 1 p.m. Thursday, January 23rd, and this also constitute the adjournment of the Senate. Without objection, so ordered. Senate is adjourned. <laughs>